Good evening and welcome to our audience here on the campus of Broward College in Davie, Florida, to our statewide audience on television and on Florida Public Radio, and to our national audience on C-SPAN. Our panelists tonight, Neil Brown, editor and vice president for the Tampa Bay Times, Patricia Mazze, political writer for the Miami Herald. First, the rules tonight, and they are quite simple. Each candidate has 90 seconds to answer a question. All rebuttals and follow-ups are 30-second responses at the discretion of the moderator, and that's me. By coin toss, Congressman Murphy, you have the first opening statement tonight. All right, well, thank you very much, and good evening. Thank you for being here this evening. I decided to get involved in public service because I was tired of the name-calling, the finger-pointing and bickering. And I'm proud of what I've accomplished over the past four years in Washington. One of my greatest achievements was working with Republicans and Democrats to help authorize nearly $2 billion of funding for the Everglades. I've worked across party lines to bring together 200 members of Congress to ensure that we prevent cuts to Medicare Advantage. And I'm proud of the legislation I passed to help lower flood insurance rates for Floridians and help our citrus farmers dealing with greening. And these accomplishments are in stark contrast to my opponent, who doesn't even show up to work. In fact, Senator Rubio has the worst voting record of any senator from Florida in nearly 50 years and has gone on to endorse Donald Trump, the man that, by his own account, he doesn't trust with the nuclear codes. And that's exactly why Florida's four major newspapers have endorsed me, including the Miami Herald, his hometown paper, because they know I'm going to show up to work each and every day for the people of Florida. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for hosting this debate and everybody for being here, and I appreciate the opportunity. Here's the choice in this election, because elections are at their best when they're about clear choices, and this election is a clear choice. It's a choice between someone and myself who's proud of my six years in the Senate and before that, my nine years in the Florida legislature. I actually have real concrete achievements I can point to, things I've been able to do on behalf of the state of Florida. For example, the Central Everglades Planning Project that's basically been stuck in limbo for over a decade. It passed because I was able to convince a key colleague of mine to change his mind and become a supporter of it. You know that today, American foreign aid around the world is leveraged to ensure that we're taking on human trafficking because of the Girls Count Act that I passed. You know, slum lords in Jacksonville and Riviera Beach and Orlando, they're under investigation because of the pressure I, working with Senator Nelson, put on them. Time and again, during my six years in the Senate, I've proven I can get things done, and I encourage voters to compare that to Congressman Murphy's record. He cited some examples tonight of achievements. They're not true. And as you'll learn throughout this debate, he's been there for four years, and no one's even noticed. This is a clear record and a clear difference, and that's the choice between voters. We're too important a state to have a senator that doesn't know how to get things done. I do, and I will. All right, Senator, thank you. Gentlemen, each of your Senate campaigns has been targeted by one primary criticism. We're going to begin by allowing you to address that criticism directly. Congressman Murphy, I'll start with you. You have repeatedly been attacked during this campaign as someone who has padded his resume. Now, you cite your work as a CPA and a small businessman as reasons you'd make a good U.S. Senator. Though we know you never became a licensed CPA in the state of Florida, and you ran an environmental cleanup business with your father for, for less than six months. Explain why this experience qualifies you for the work in the U.S. Senate. Yes, well, thank you for this question. And I'm so grateful for PolitiFact, an independent fact-checking agency that has gone through these accusations. And in fact, the last seven claims thrown out by Senator Rubio and his right-wing friends have all been debunked, rated as false. Here's the facts. I am a CPA, got my license in 2009. I'm one of nine CPAs in the House of Representatives right now. And if elected to the Senate, would be the second CPA in the history of our country to serve there. And if you look at our fiscal house, I think we could probably use a few more CPAs. And I'm proud of my small business experience, proud of what I was able to do to help prevent some of the oil that was coming down and potentially coming down our West Coast. And I'm proud and would be quite willing, quite frankly, to put up my experience in the private sector as a CPA and small business person up against my opponent, who's been a lobbyist and career politician his entire career. You see, we need changes in Washington, D.C. And Senator Rubio has been lockstep with the special interest groups. He's done nothing but do the bidding for the interest groups. In fact, we all know he never shows up to work. But when he does, he has a 98% voting record with the Koch brothers, a right-wing special interest group. You see, I believe we can do more. And I'm proud of my accomplishments because they've all been bipartisan in nature. I've been able to bring home money to help with research for our citrus farmers 
bring home money to help the Everglades. Was able to work with Congressman Yoho just recently to help our veterans with the backlog. I will continue reaching across the aisle to solve these problems in the United States Senate to help the people of Florida. All right, Congressman, thank you. Senator Rubio, you said in last week's debate that you'll serve a full six-year term in the U.S. Senate, God willing. And you used that qualifier four times in the debate. Now, we know you said the prayer convinced you following the Pulse nightclub shootings that this Senate race is one you needed to be in, even though he had originally declared you would not run while you're running for president. Is God willing a, a way out in case prayer convinces you to change your mind about a, a run in 2020 for the White House? No, God willing is something I always say, because I deeply believe that while man plans his steps, it's God that plans our course. I do. I believe that, for example, no matter what happens on November 8th, on November 9th, the sun is going to rise and the creator of the universe will still be sitting on the throne and that everything that's going to happen will be ordered by him. I believe that deeply. And so that's why I always use that. It's not a qualifier. It's what I truly believe. Now, let me address what Congressman Murphy just said a moment ago, because I think he's living up to his reputation as a serial embellisher. First of all, he didn't run because he was a CPA. When he ran for Congress four years ago, he told people his experience as a CPA was going to make him a good congressman. The problem is he doesn't have any. Because in Florida, he doesn't have a license to be a CPA. And you can't be a CPA in Florida and work as one if you don't have a license. He still doesn't have a Florida CPA license. He talked here again today about how he helped clean up the oil spill. He didn't. Independent fact checkers confirm he didn't have a single contract to do so. So why does someone make things up? You make them up because you don't have anything real to point to. The congressman talked about $2 billion that he was able to get for the Everglades. No, he didn't. That was part, those were projects that were in the water bill that were suggested by the Army Corps of Engineers a long time ago. He had nothing to do with them being in the bill and they would have passed with or without him. He talked about saving Medicare Advantage recently. He didn't do anything except sign on to a letter. He didn't save Medicare Advantage. He has no record of achievement and I encourage people to compare that to the things I've done in my nine years in Tallahassee, including two as speaker, and the things that I've done over the last six years, bill after bill. There are sanctions today on Hezbollah because of a bill I passed. Maduro in Venezuela has been sanctioned, not once but twice, because of a bill I passed, and on and on. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Can I just jump in here? Yes, you, you can. Senator, if you voted as much as you lied, you might actually be a decent senator. But you continue to throw out these lies. They have all been debunked by PolitiFact. You see, I'm proud of what I've accomplished, proud of what I've done, and again, willing to put that up to your record. And look, you know, we were already just asked this question about your comments about not running for office. Let's rewind a little bit here. You said 10,000 times was your quote that you weren't going to run for the Senate again. And the day before qualifying, of course, you throw your name back in. And then it takes you four months to finally admit to the voters that you want this job. Senator, it took you four months to do that. All of a sudden, the polls are dead tied, and he's now going to lie to you all again and tell you he's going to serve a full term. Florida deserves better than that. That's your time, sir. And I want to let the yeah, senator respond to that. Thank you. Well, first of all, the reason why he keeps bringing this up about me changing my mind is because it would have been a lot easier for him to win if I hadn't changed my mind. And so that's why he's probably upset that I decided to run. Second of all, we are now, what, 10 minutes into the debate. You've been given two chances to talk about your achievements. You don't have any. You've been there for four years. It's like it never even happened. Now, Florida is not just an important electoral state. It's the third largest state in the country, may potentially one day become the second largest, a key state in our country. Very, very, virtually every major issue before America has a presence here. We cannot afford to have someone in the United States Senate that after four years in Congress has never gotten anything done. Right, never. And I, again, I encourage people to compare in. that to my record Gentlemen, of getting things done bill after bill, law after law, in, policy after policy that happened because, because I was there. Gentlemen, if I could, and, and uh, being the referee is no good. They didn't even give me a, a whistle tonight. But we have so much to cover. Right. As you mentioned, we're 10 minutes in. The next question is Social Security. It, and it begins with you, Senator. You said earlier this year you'd favor increasing the retirement age for Social Security from 67 to 70 for future retirees. You're telling workers younger than 55 they'll have to work three extra years. That is correct. That is not correct. So right now, as the law stands, the age is already going up incrementally. So for example, someone like me, I'm 45. After this year, I feel 46, but I'm 45. And, uh, and I would say that for me, instead of retiring at 67, I'd have to retire at 67 and a half. And here's the key. Nothing would change for people that are either retired or about to retire. My mom's 86 years old. She can't go back to work, and she relies on Social Security and Medicare as her key sustenance. I want that to continue unchanged. I don't want to change anything for people that are on it now or people that are near retirement. 
But yes, for younger workers, there was going to have to be some smaller changes or it won't exist. These programs are going bankrupt. Anyone who tells you that we can leave it exactly the way it is, is lying to you. And the longer we wait to address this reality, the likelier it's going to be that we may have to disrupt these programs for people already retired. I don't want to see that happen. Medicare and Social Security is not just critical of Floridians. It's critical to my mother, to people in my family. I want this program to survive, to thrive, and to be there when I retire, when my children retire, and for Americans on and on. But it won't be if we continue on the course that it is on now. All right, Congressman Murphy, you said you oppose cutting Social Security benefits. You won't raise the eligibility age or reduce benefits based on income. So what will you do to protect Social Security? Yes, well, you see, there's a stark contrast between my opponent and I when it comes to Social Security and Medicare. I believe these are two of the top achievements in our country's history. They've lifted and kept more people out of poverty than probably anything else. And you see, follow the money, folks. My opponent has taken millions and millions of dollars from special interest groups that want to dismantle these programs, which explains why he said Social Security and Medicare have, quote, weakened us as a people. You see, Senator Rubio wants to put Social Security, your money, in Wall Street. He wants to privatize it. He wants to turn Medicare into a voucher program, dismantling these programs. I couldn't disagree further. I believe we need to strengthen these programs. And I've introduced a bill called the Save Benefits Act that actually gives seniors a raise, helps with their cost of living adjustments. And I believe that by raising the cap, we can actually ensure that these programs are there not only for our current seniors, but for my generation and younger, because these programs have to be protected. If I respond, the comment about weakening as our people is as true as a CPA license is real. It's non-existent. Here's the bottom line. What I said is the debt is weakening our country. It absolutely is. It's $17 trillion. If you think about Social Security, it was designed when we had 16 workers for every retiree. Today we are down to three workers for every retiree, and soon it will be down to two workers for every retiree. So anyone, including alleged CPAs, should be able to do the math and realize very quickly that this program's in a lot of trouble if there aren't some adjustments made to it. I don't want to... Uh, dismantle Social Security and Medicare. Not only, how do you explain that to voters, how do you explain that to my mother who's on Social Security and Medicare? I want to save it, I want to preserve it, I want to improve it for people that are on it now, but there will have to be changes to the way it works for future beneficiaries in my generation, in the congressman's Sir, generation, and in my children's generation. Sir, I'll offer a rebuttal uh, opportunity for the congressman. Thank you, because you know it's nice that you're talking moderate about these programs, but forget your quote, that was you weakened us as a people. Beyond that, it's the programs you supported. It's the Ryan Bill. It's privatizing Social Security and turning Medicare into a voucher program. That dismantles these programs. That is a huge change for these programs. So it's not just what you're saying right now on stage. It's it's what you've actually done as a senator. That should be very scary to our seniors. We can do more to ensure these programs are going to be there for generations to come. And I'm going to just say that that is false. I do not support privatizing Social Security. In fact, that, I said that repeatedly in 2010 when I ran the first time. I have never support, I do not support privatizing Social Security. Mm -hmm. And I do not support turning Medicare into a voucher. I support turning it into a choice, which, by the way, it is now in many ways. That Medicare Advantage, which you claim to have saved from cuts, you did not, of course, is a choice program. It allows people on Medicare to decide whether they want to stay on traditional Medicare or go to a private provider. My mother's on Medicare Advantage. It works well for her. I just want more people to have that option. All right, gentlemen, well, thank the fact you. Checkers get to this one. Gentlemen, thank you. We're going to move on with a question from my colleague, Neil Brown of the Tampa Bay Times. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you. Let's talk about health care for a moment. Congressman Murphy. Yesterday, we learned that premiums for many of those insured under the Affordable Care Act are expected to rise an average of 25 percent next year. That's awfully steep. You've said you'd support some changes to the law. Can you be more specific than you've been so far as to what needs to be done to improve the law and reduce premiums? Yes, well, thank you for that question. And there's no question that the Affordable Care Act was a huge step forward for our country. But the focus now has to be on getting it right. Right, working across the aisle to ensure that we are fixing it, making sure that we have more coverage for more people that's more affordable. And I believe we can do that, but you got to show up to work and you got to be willing to reach across the aisle. And you see, Senator Rubio uh, has spent the last six years trying to undermine this legislation. He wants to take us back to the days where you could get dropped from your health insurance plan if you got sick, where you could be denied coverage if you had a pre-existing condition 
where women were being charged more than men just because they were women, where seniors were being charged more for their prescription drugs. That's where he wants to take us back to. And I know he's about to tell us about the risk corridors and the, the plan that he's put forward. You see, that should be renamed the Florida premium increase. That is exactly why, and many healthcare experts have said, that is why our health insurance rates are going up right now because of his plan. So I don't know why he brags about this. That has actually made it more expensive for you all. Congress I believe before. that we can expand Medicaid. Before. That means 900,000 more people in Florida alone would have access to affordable health care. I believe we should be pushing to ensure that our government is negotiating with the pharmaceutical companies. And I believe that we can do more to go after the waste, fraud, abuse, and duplication in our health care system. I also believe that we should be looking at a public option, especially in rural areas, because one of the major premises of the Affordable Care Act was that there was competition, that there were more people fighting to insure you. But you got to have that competition. The, pri the public option would be available for those to help lower those insurance rates. All right, let's ask yeah, Senator well, Rubio. Let, me, say first of let all, me ask you this question this way. You've repeatedly vowed to repeal Obamacare, but today, 20 more million Americans are insured since when you ran for this office the first time. What, if you were a repeal of the Affordable Care Act, what will you do tomorrow for the people who have health insurance today? Sure, the great question. Let me first begin by saying he called it risk corridor, not a risk corridor, it's a bailout. Let me explain what happened when they negotiated Obamacare so everybody clearly understands. One of the ways that the Obama administration got the big insurance companies to support Obamacare is they put a provision in the law that said this, if you guys lose money under Obamacare and we know you're going to lose money, we're going to bail you out and we're going to use taxpayer money to do it. And yes, I'm proud of the fact that we got rid of that. Why should we be using taxpayer money to bail out private insurance companies who are making millions of dollars in profits? Why should you be bailing out private insurance companies? And I want Congressman Murphy to answer, why is that the right thing for our country? Why should any of us, why should taxpayers be bailing out private insurance companies? I'm proud that we got rid of that. Now, what should we do instead of Obamacare? I do not want to go back to the old system. The old system didn't work. His answer, by the way, he didn't have an answer on a plan. His plan is, I want to make Obamacare even bigger. That's what his answer was. Here's a better approach. Number one, today, if your employer wants to give you money and say, here, instead of buying an insurance plan, we're going to give you health care money, and you can use it to buy any plan you want, you have to pay taxes on that money. I want to get rid of that. I want to make sure that if an employer decides to give you the money to go out and buy your own health care, that you can do so tax-free. Or, of course, they can continue to buy it for you. If that is not available to you, I want every American to have a fully refundable tax credit, which they can use to buy health insurance from any company in America, across state lines, of the kind of health insurance you want. And for people for pre-existing conditions, that is the part that the government should step in and fill with a high-risk pool where we can insure people that find it difficult to find insurance because they have pre-existing conditions that ultimately make them uninsurable. That is a much better approach than the system we have now where you are forcing people onto Obamacare because if they don't, they get fined on their taxes. Senator, thank you. Congressman yes, Rebuttal. Yes, please. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the high-risk pools, too. You see, that plan that you just put forward, Senator, has been tried in 35 states, and it failed in all 35 states. It adds billions of dollars to the deficit. It makes it more expensive and drops people from their plans. And it's already failed. But that's, of course, the talking point given to him by the Koch brothers and the other special interest groups. That plan doesn't work. We can make the Affordable Care Act more affordable. We can make sure that more people have access to it. And in these risk corridors, the idea was to help level and smooth the cost because they didn't know who was going to sign up how risky they were going to be, what health care problems they were going to have. So they wanted to help level that out so we didn't have these surges in prices that we're seeing right now. But because of your legislation that you passed, we do have a spike. So it's thanks to you that Floridians are now paying more, and you're bragging about that? That makes no sense. Well, I think Congressman Murphy should answer again the question that I asked. Why is it right for you, the American taxpayer, to have to bail out private insurance companies? These companies are making record profits. I'm Why should we be people, bailing out private companies. insurance? This is not about evening anything out. This is about ensuring that these companies would participate in Obamacare with the promise that if they lost money, you, the taxpayer, were going to bail them out. And the only thing my law did is said, you can bail them out with their money that they're paying as a fee into the program, but you cannot bail them out with taxpayer money. And just to tell you the lawlessness of this administration, you know what the administration is doing now? The administration has gone to the insurance companies and has said to them, don't worry, just sue us. 
and we won't defend ourselves in court, you'll get a default judgment against us and you'll get your taxpayer money anyway. This is an outrage. Senator, no one should be in now. favor of taxpayer money bailing out insurance companies. Senator, thank you. We're going to move on now to the Supreme Court. This is for both of you. We'll begin with Congressman Murphy. The next president is expected to send several new Supreme Court nominees to the Senate for confirmation. What criteria will be important to you to confirm a nominee from a president of the opposing party? Yes, well, the Constitution is pretty clear on this one. It's the president's role to nominate a Supreme Court justice, and it is the Senate's job to confirm that individual. In fact, I think this is one of the most important jobs of being a United States senator. And I think it's critical that whomever that choice is, number one, understands the Constitution, that they will follow the rule of law, and that they will be able to make sure that that is played out fairly and equitably for everybody in our country. And this is one of the areas that I think is pretty disturbing to a lot of Americans, quite frankly, because uh, the Senate hasn't acted. You see, the Senate hasn't even had a hearing on Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, by all accounts, is as qualified as anybody we've ever had to be in the Supreme Court. Yet there hasn't been a hearing. In fact, Senator Rubio hasn't even taken the time to meet with Merrick Garland. I guess he's too busy running for president, but he hasn't even taken the time to get to know him to ask these simple questions. And the American people right now are so frustrated with Congress, right? They're mad at the House, they're mad at the Senate, they're mad at Republicans and Democrats. But I don't think they ever expected that the dysfunction in the House would ever bleed over to the Supreme Court. And that's what's happening right now. You see, the Supreme Court isn't even taking up certain cases right now because they know it's going to be a tie. Right? That is a complete, uh, unnecessary course of action. It's all because of the obstructionists and the Tea Party Republicans like Senator Rubio that care more about their own ambitions than they do getting things done for the people of Florida and this country. Senator Rubio, again, the question is the criteria that are important a nominee from the opposition party should the president of the opposing there's party one, be in the White House. First of all, there's one primary criteria, and that is that the person understands the proper role of the Supreme Court in this country. I don't care what the justice's personal views are. I want to understand, and I want a record that proves that they understand what the proper role of the Supreme Court is. Let me tell you what the proper role of the Supreme Court is not. The proper role of the Supreme Court is not to write laws. That is the job of the legislative branch that's accountable to voters. The proper role of the Supreme Court is to take the case before them and apply the Constitution according to its original meaning. What did those words mean to the people who wrote them? Now, if you don't like what the Constitution says, then we have a constitutional amendment process. And that process is the way you change the Constitution. So what I care about, my number one criteria is, is the person before us as a nominee, because they're all smart people, they all went to Ivy League schools, they're all intelligent, but do they understand the proper role of the court? And let me tell you that if the people on that court are not people that understand the proper role, then we will lose our Constitution. Because the role of the court is to apply that Constitution according to its original meaning, and that is the singular criteria that I will use in evaluating any nomination from either president, Republican or Democrat, that comes before the Senate. Gentlemen, thank you both. We're going to move on now to my colleague Patricia Mazze from the Miami Herald. Good evening, gentlemen. Senator Rubio, nearly half a million people have died in the five-year civil war in Syria, including tens of thousands of children. Millions of people fleeing their homes led to a refugee crisis and opened the door to ISIS. You voted against uh, U.S. airstrikes in Syria in 2013. Would you vote to commit U.S. ground troops to join the rebels' fight and topple the Assad regime? Well, first let me say that the situation in Syria today is much more difficult to solve than it would have been four years ago when I outlined and prodded the president for a cl cl very clear way forward. What I asked at the time was, let's identify elements on the ground in Syria that we believe we can work with. Now listen, they're not going to find a lot of you know, Thomas Jefferson's running around in Syria. But let's find people we can work with, and let's ensure that they are the best equipped, best trained group on the ground, because if you don't, it will leave a vacuum. And that vacuum is going to be filled in Syria the way every vacuum is filled in the Middle East, and that is by radical jihadists. The president chose not to pursue that route. As a result, people say moderate groups, or certainly less Islamist groups, declined in their capabilities, creating the vacuum for ISIS to emerge after they crossed over from Iraq and the situation that we find ourselves in today. The bottom line is this, our interests in Syria at this moment are singular, and that is to ensure that it is not a haven, a safe haven, for radical Islamists to be able to take root and plan attacks against the United States and our interests around the world. And so if a president comes forward with a plan that works, that could actually achieve that aim, I was most certainly considerate. I do not believe it will require ground troops. In fact, I believe that would be counterproductive. 
but I do think the United States would need to do more in the furtherance of that plan. And the reason why I voted against the president's proposal was because that was not what the president was proposing. He was proposing what they called pinprick strikes, basically a symbolic strike to send a message, but not backed up by a clear plan. And in fact, when I voted against it, I articulated what we should have been doing instead. This president failed to do so. It left behind a vacuum. And the vacuum has not only been filled now by radical Islamists, that vacuum has now been filled by Iran and by Vladimir Putin. And the result is we have even less influence in that region today than we did just four years ago. Yes, well, there's no question that things have become much more complicated in Syria. But it was pretty clear. The people of Syria spoke out five years ago that they wanted to have a small voice, at least some say, in their government. And since then, what have we seen? Assad has done nothing but murder and kill, use chemical weapons on his own people. So we have to make it abundantly clear that Assad must leave power. And we must do that by working with our allies. But what we're seeing is a more complicated situation developing. And as a member of the House Intelligence Committee, I think it's critical that we unite to ensure that this problem doesn't get any worse. And what we're seeing now is Vladimir Putin getting more and more involved behind Assad, continuing to help boost him up. And I believe that it is our alliances that are going to help bring Assad down and get Russia out. But how do we do that? You see, it's these alliances. And those very alliances that will give us that strength, the choice of Marco Rubio, Donald Trump, to be our next commander in chief, he wants to tear up those alliances. That's not gonna strengthen us. You see, Senator Rubio has lost all credibility, in my opinion, by supporting Donald Trump in this election. Because Donald Trump, we all know, has millions of dollars of financial ties to Putin, thinks Putin is, quote, a strong leader, and now wants to tear up the very alliances that will help ensure that we get rid of Assad. So it's pretty confusing to me, especially somebody that's on the House Intelligence Committee that knows how precarious this situation is and knows how dangerous Vladimir Putin's involvement in Russia and the Middle East is. Well, if I may respond, a couple points. Secretary Clinton, the Democratic nominee, was the Secretary of State when these decisions were being made. And that's who you support for President of the United States. I disagree with Donald Trump on this issue, and I've repeatedly pointed as to why he's wrong on a number of issues. You talk about the alliances, I'm not sure which alliance you're talking about. For example, the United States today is working with Kurdish elements in the northern part of Syria as they attempt to close what's called the Manbij province. That has created an incredible strain between us and our Turkish allies to the north, who view their effort to unify those cantons as a direct risk to them. And so which alliance are you talking about? The one with the Kurds or the, the Syrian Kurds or the one with the Turks? This is the situation this president has put us in. He's put us in this situation because he has no credibility either with the Turks and increasingly with the Syrian Kurds as well. And so, again, these are the consequences of a failed foreign policy. This country today has less influence in Syria than it did three or four years ago as the direct result of the broken foreign policy of Barack Obama, much of which was instituted in this part of the world when Secretary Clinton was over in the, Senate, in the State Department. It is important to note how many factions are involved in Syria right now, whether that's the Kurds, the Peshmerga, Iraq, Hezbollah, Russia, uh, the moderate rebel forces that we have tried to arm in many ways. And it's important to talk about them because I think Senator Ruby and I, both members of the Intelligence Committee, know how complicated it is. But we also both know that Donald Trump probably can't name or identify any of those groups or their involvement. Yet you are continuing to support Donald Trump. We have seen 16 U.S. senators not only disavow Donald Trump, but unendorse him because they know how dangerous he is to our country. So you've got to be able to stand up to people like Donald Trump if you care about our national security. Gentlemen, at this point, we're going to, we're going yeah, to stop. Yeah, but I mean, I just say, because he criticized someone for not knowing the facts about the region. Congressman, there are no Peshmerga in Syria. The Peshmerga are Iraqi. Yes, um, and so fighting. again, so no, and they the, are the, helping us fight <laughs> in Iraq, not? not in Syria. The Syrian uh, Kurds, in fact, don't get along with the Iraqi Kurds, which is adding more which to is the complexity why it's so of the region. Here's the bottom line: Syria is not going to be New Zealand anytime in the near future. Our interest in that part of the world is to ensure that there is stability in that region, stability so that, and, and at minimum, that there isn't a vacuum that can be filled by radical jihadist, jihadist elements who use that vacuum to plot against our country. Congressman. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, I mean, it just goes back to the same point that, can, you know, Senator Rubio continues to support Donald Trump. And it is shameful that he stands there with him when you know that Trump doesn't even know any of this. We are seeing what's happening in Mosul right now. Donald Trump is saying it's a failed plan that's not even working. We are going to move on Raqqa, and we have to continue working with all of the various factions that we get along with. But we haven't had any action, well, and we haven't had leaders willing to stand up. And look, I will stand up to any 
anybody, whether they're Republican, whether they're Democrat, point, to do what I think is best. This last question has gone on very long. We have other issues I know you both want to get to. I want everybody to take a breath, take a drink of water. We're going to take a very quick break and come right back. You're watching Decision 2016 before you vote. Again, we'll return in just a moment.